Um, I, uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I, I'm the strategy director at Mondelez, uh, and I'll, I'll describe what Mondelez is in, in more detail. Some of you may have heard of it. It's a very large, fast-moving consumer goods organization. And prior to that, I have a, a long history in management consulting uh, in, across the Asia-Pacific region. So this topic of full potential, how to define full potential, how to help organizations get to its full potential in a transformative, step-change way, is something that has been very close to my heart. Uh, over, over many years. So what I'd like to share today is a little bit uh, about Mondelez, uh, who we are and where we've come from. Uh, a little bit about full potential, the way in which we look at it at Mondelez and from my perspective, and a specific case study, which actually is from Japan, uh, uh, where, where I was based for the last two years. So, so who's Mondelez? Um, Mondelez uh, was a spin-off from Kraft Foods. Uh, many of you would know who Kraft Foods is. Uh, if you go back five years ago, there were two big organizations, Kraft Foods and Cadbury. Cadbury was a global confectionery business. Kraft Foods was a North American uh, grocery business. Kraft acquired Mondelez and then spun, uh, Kraft acquired Cadbury and then spun off Mondelez in October of 2012. Uh, Mondelez is the snack food business, the specialist snack food business that has been spun off and listed on NASDAQ. So today, uh, we're a $35 billion company. Uh, uh, we've got 100,000 people around the world. Uh, we play in five major categories, um, and of those, three specific categories make up 75% of our revenue, and that is chocolate, uh, biscuit, gum, and candy. Um, we have uh, either number one or number two positions in all of our, all of our categories around the world. Uh, we are the biggest biscuit company in the world. Uh, we're also the biggest chocolate company in the world. So uh, we've enjoyed quite a bit of success, and many of our brands you would recognize, uh, irrespective of where you've grown up in, uh, across the region. Uh, depending on whether you're, you, you're from, uh, for example, the US or the Europe, you would recognize brands like Milka as a, as a chocolate brand. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I was born in India, India, but I'm from Australia. And in both India and in Australia, Cadbury is a very, very strong heritage brand that has been around for many, many years. Uh, there are also significant biscuit brands that you would have heard of, like Oreo and Ritz, and as well as uh, candy and gum brands like Dentine, Trident, Hall's Candy, etc. So these are uh, the interesting thing about working for a company like Mondelez, and I was in consulting for many years, and you could never explain to your family what a consultant does. With Mondelez, it brings a smile to everybody's face. When I tell my children, uh, they think I work in a chocolate factory, and it, it, there's nothing more uh, uh, exciting than that. So. Uh, and actually, that is our higher purpose as a company. Our higher purpose as a company is to create delicious moments of joy. I mean, yes, of course we make snack food, and of course we have chocolate brands and biscuit brands, and they're kind of fun, but the reality is what we show up for work every day, what's our higher order purpose? It's about bringing small moments of joy. We know we're not here making life-saving drugs. Uh, we know that uh, it's about those small moments uh, of, of joy in, in, a, in a consumer's life. And this is very much the ethos, the, the philosophy that we anchor ourselves to. So, full potential, what do we mean by full potential and in the Asia-Pacific context? And by the way, I work in the Asia-Pacific business and Singapore is the headquarters for Asia-Pacific. What do we mean by full potential? Uh, in order to understand full potential in our context, uh, it's worth defining, firstly, what is the ultimate success measure in fast-moving consumer goods? Of course, ultimately, it's revenue and profit growth. But the real success measure for us in our business is, is market share. Because if we have market share, then revenue and sustainable profit growth will follow. So we anchor our businesses very much to the single goal of driving and maximizing market share in the categories and in the markets in which we play. So then, therefore, if you unpack that and you say, well, how do you get to full potential market share? What are the drivers of market share? Really, it comes down to three in our business. Uh, the first is putting delicious brands out there that consumers want to buy in it. If we do that, uh, it does two things. It drives the penetration of our brands, that is, the household penetration, the number of households that have tried our brand and consumed it in the last 12 months. It also drives the number of occasions in which a consumer might use our brands. If you think about chocolate and a brand like Cadbury, uh, you know, one occasion could be personal indulgence. I buy chocolate and I eat it to treat myself. Another could be a sharing occasion, where you know, in Australia, for example, Easter and Christmas are very big gifting and chocolate sharing occasions. And another might be uh, you know, Cadbury in, in, a, in, a, in a powdered beverage format as a, as a, as a, as a nourishment, uh, as, as a hot chocolate. So these are, as you can see, the same brand and the same underlying product 
that has been delivered and, and, and is sort of servicing multiple consumer needs and consumer occasions. So that is the first kind of driver of full potential success in, in our business. The second is perfect store. We're a brand's business. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't run retail chains. You don't buy your products, uh, Cadbury and Orient and so forth, directly from us. You buy it from a supermarket or a convenience store uh, and so on and so forth. So if you like, our brands are trying to connect with the consumer, but what we're really trying to do is to build a relationship with a customer who's a retailer. So we work with the retailers to execute our brands very well in store, not only for our brands to win, but also for the category to win, because ultimately it's got to be a win-win. If you think about it from a retailer's point of view, what they're trying to do is to grow the category. So we really partner with them on, 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 on doing that. And there are a number of levers for doing that in a store environment. Um, the kind of things that you achieve when you do this well is you drive distribution. That means that if you partner well with your retailer, more and more stores uh, carry your product. So you've got greater availability out there. Your brand is more ubiquitous. The other is you increase visibility in store. That means that you uh, resonate and connect with a shopper, and it's more likely that uh, you know, a shopper will connect a brand image and, and actually purchase your product uh, at, during a shopping trip. The third one, and this is the one that is the common denominator for any industry, is efficient operations. If we do that well, it creates the fuel that we need in order to be able to invest in our brands and drive the first two. So when we look at full potential in our business, it always invariably comes back to these three underlying drivers. The balance between them may be different depending on the context, but really it comes down to these three. So then in our Asia-Pacific context, um, if you think about the markets in which we play, uh, using uh, kind of uh, wealth or GDP per capita as one measure, growth rate, GDP growth rate is another measure, and the third as the addressable market, which is how big is the market for our brands and our categories in these countries. It pretty quickly uh, separates out, and this is not, I'm not telling you, I don't think anybody here something they don't know, it separates out into uh, two distinct groups of markets in Asia Pacific. One is uh, developed markets, where the growth rates are low, but the addressable market is large and the GDP per capita is large, which means, by the way, that implies good margins for your product, right? And the other is emerging markets, where the categories are either low or, or, or large already, but rapidly growing. And within addressable markets like developed and emerging, the four countries that stand out in our business, in developed markets, Asia Pacific, Australia, and Japan, as the two largest markets uh, in, in the region. And in the emerging markets, China and India. So this is kind of the way the, 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 the marketplace looks for us through our, through our lens. Why is this important? It's important because when you think about what it takes to win in these markets, it looks very, very different. When you go to a typical hypermarket or a supermarket in a developed country like Australia, you look at something like this, right? Crowded shelves, be bewildering set of choices. So what that means for us as a player is if you're standing in front of a shelf in a supermarket, you have more and more products fighting for shelf space. Precious real estate on the, on, on the shelf. While at the same time, the retailer is trying to create less and less room for your category. And in fact, he's trying to do that by increasing his private label range at the same time. Okay? And when that happens, it puts the squeeze on your branded products. So your branded products are pushed to fewer and fewer locations and less and less visible spots on the shelf. And all of this is happening in front of a consumer who now has less and less time, right, with less time to decide, and a wider range of acceptable choices, and is more price sensitive and value conscious. So this is, in a developed market context, the challenge that we face. And you can see that it, it's, it's a pretty tough and competitive playing field, no matter how strong your brand is, no matter how formidable you are as, a, as an organization. If you flick to emerging markets, here's the reality. Chocolate melts, right? And most of Asia Pacific markets in the emerging context operate in hot countries. And why is that important? Because chocolate gets sold in stores like this. Five million outlets in China, seven million in India, two million in Indonesia, right? To distribute your products into a set of outlets like this is a complex route to market. You're working through a whole range of wholesalers and distributors to get your product there. And that means you have less control over the point of buying, you have less control over the logistics chain, and therefore, you know, uh, you know arguably, it's a, it's a harder not to crack in some ways. Even though you may not have the same problems you do in the developed market, it's a different kind of challenge in emerging market. 
So I just wanted to kind of set that context on, on Asia Pacific, even within our business, how diverse a geography and, and a landscape it actually is. So in our business, when we look at our different positions in Asia Pacific, we tend to look at it like this. And the size of the bubble, by the way, indicates the size of the business. I've taken off the country names and so forth. If we think about market growth, and if we think about our growth, they pretty much fall into this kind of setup where if the market growth is high and our growth is high, you end up in the top right-hand corner. So your full potential opportunity there is to scale up your current business as quickly as possible. Yeah? And on the other extreme, if your market growth is low and you're underperforming the market, really there is a turnaround opportunity there. So that means that those drivers we talked about earlier, you know, do you pull the consumer brands driver or the perfect store driver or the cost driver, the mix of those three things looks different depending on your, on your starting point. So at this point, I wanted to talk about a specific case study. Um, and when we go through these case studies, um, we typically, as a strategy function, when we work with our, our, uh, our business, we follow, from a full potential point of view, these four steps always. That is, set the aspiration, galvanize the team around a specific agenda, mobilize a plan, and then the hardest part of all of this, of course, is to stay the course. Because when you're faced with hitting in-year and in-quarter results, it's very easy to take your eye off the end game. So the case study I wanted to take you through was Japan. That's where I spent the last two years of my life. And I was there specifically uh, for a reason, to drive this full potential opportunity in Japan. So a quick reset on Japan and what it is. As I said to you, we've got a number of different categories. In Japan, we are predominantly a gum, candy, and a biscuits business. Uh, we have quite a strong position. Uh, we have some strong gum brands. We are the number two player, a strong number two in gum. We are the number one in bagged candy, which is, our, which is our anchor category. And we have very strong positions in biscuit, with Oreo, Ritz, and Premium as our three brands. So this business has been in Japan for decades and has done very, very well. When I got there, and if you look at the history from 2005 to 2013, in particular with the gum category, and, and it's interesting I picked the gum category, because gum category doesn't exist in Singapore. <laughs> so you can't, but nevertheless, it's an, it's an interesting one to, to discuss. This is what we were, we were facing. Uh, the bottom line there with the percentage signs is the gum category itself, year on year change. So you can see from 2005 to 2013, it has been a pretty steady decline. Yeah? At the beginning, it was declined circa 2% year on year. By the time we got to 2012, 2013, we were looking at you know, 6, 7% year on year. The red line in the middle is our sales performance in that country. It zigzagged up and down depending on the performance we had on a given year and the kind of performance we were lapping from the previous year. But essentially, the, the trend was down and was, you can see, by and large, hugging the category. Right? Until 2012, of course, this was an issue in that our gum business was in decline in revenue terms. It was less of an issue for us because of the top blue line. During the same period from 2005 to 2012, our market share, which we, you know, as I defined earlier, is a key measure of whether our business is operating at full potential, was on the way up. That means even though the category was declining, we were holding share and growing our positions at the same time versus vis-a-vis -vis our competitors. In 2012, that changed. In 2012, a couple of things happened. One is our sales dropped significantly. You can see what happened to the red line there. Our market share dropped. Well, in fact, our market share dropping drove our, our sales result. And the category took a real hit. I mean, it went from 6% to 7.5% decline, which is now we're, now we're talking serious. It's in free fall. Right? And the other thing that happened during that same period was the Japanese yen devalued by 20% uh, thanks to Abe-san's uh, Abe economics policies, which is, has been great for the country. But as a business that uh, you know, sources product from, from, from around Asia, this put a lot of pressure on our, on, our, on our input costs. So our business faced real challenges. And, and as a result of that, over that time frame, over that three year time frame, our revenue declined by 9%. We lost 50 basis points in margin. So we, were, we, were in, we had a situation here, as they say. And if you go back to my bubble chart earlier, effectively, this would have fallen in the bottom left-hand corner as a turnaround for potential opportunity. The other thing, and, and, and I'm sure many of you worked in Japan, uh, you would know, is that the, the uh, Japanese work ethic and, and, and how strong that really is. Uh, this business had really lost its morale, had lost its mojo, as they say. Um, 
there was significant pressure from the region and from our US headquarters to turn the business around. No matter what this business did, it couldn't pick up its performance quarter on quarter. There was further and further scrutiny, right? And a real loss of self-confidence. So if you like, this, I, I found this picture on the web. Uh, this, this, this epitomizes the, the, the mood of the, of the people in the organization. Uh, very late nights, really just, really just despondent. So we had a number of challenges. We had to, of course, drive the underlying performance of our business. And in order to do that, we needed to do something about the category. Because what do you do when your category is declining 7%, right? But we also needed to, you can't do this on your own, we needed to lift the morale of the people in the business to propel them forward and take the business forward. So we followed roughly this step. First, the aspiration. Uh, in order to set an aspiration, we formed, anchored ourselves in a few insights. First insight was the gum category. The reasons why, and this is all based on the research we did very quickly in a short number of weeks. The reasons why people were chewing gum were changing. This is what was driving the underlying decline. If you go back even to when I was a kid and perhaps when you remember, chewing gum was kind of cool, right? It's over the years become much more uh, from a consumer point of view, and, and maybe you can relate to it from personal experience, maybe you can't. It has become more from a enjoyable, fun thing to more of a functional experience, breath freshening, teeth cleaning, teeth strengthening, etc. Yet gum manufacturers around the world hadn't followed that to suit. I mean, so the positioning of the brand was still anchored in, in pleasure rather than, rather than functional benefit. So we needed to reposition the brands and the category. The other point was, and this is 80% 80, 80 of confectionery in Japan is sold in convenience stores. If you've ever been to Japan, you would know. There's 7-Eleven, Family Mart, and Lawson's everywhere, right? And they're very small stores. And this is a heat map of a shopper study that we did, okay? The red is where the traffic is the greatest and where shoppers actually pause, okay? First factoid, the average shopper spends less than three minutes in a convenience store, less than three minutes. The second observation from this, they walk in through the door, which is on the top right-hand corner, they walk straight to the pink bottom row there, and guess what that is? That is ready-to-eat meals, lunch boxes, because convenience stores in Japan, that is their primary value proposition, so it's to the typical Japanese salary man where he goes to get his lunch, right? So straight to the lunch boxes, the beverage counter, to the counter on the top, checkout counter on the top, on the bottom right-hand corner there, buy your tobacco, buy your coffee, out of the door. So do they spend any time in the confectionery aisle? Actually, no, right? So actually, the category was not even visible to the shopper. That was the second insight. And this area that we call, which I've called out there as the hot zone, is, it, I'll explain, it becomes very important for us. Because the hot zone is actually that, and many of you have seen this kind of thing in most retail environments you've been to around the world, that if we can activate our gum and confectionery products right at the checkout counter or next to food and beverage where the shopper spends their time, we can drive greater conversion. Yeah? We can remind the shopper of the functional benefits of gum. The other thing was the aisle itself. So if you think about, if you remember, I spoke about the idea of a perfect store. Uh, the way it actually works is that our research has shown that if you look at a typical supermarket aisle, yeah, there is a, a diamond shape within which uh, the shopper's visibility is the greatest. So if your product is not visible within that diamond, your ability to engage the shopper during a shopping trip is, is diminished significantly. Guess what? Our products weren't performing very well if you used share of diamond as a measure of success. If you looked at the various supermarkets that we were distributed in, our performance wasn't great here. So this was the other insight we had. The final insight was if you think about consumption occasions, so consumers and the occasions in which they consume, so if you like segmenting your consumer base, it started to give us a different picture again. We've segmented our consumer base on the basis of day parts, different times of day, as well as demographics. And we found very clearly there was a particular core in which our products played right now, but there was a significant opportunity to expand outside of our current core to new occasions through pack format, through new product ranges, through new price points, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, we also find there was a pricing opportunity, that there were segments of the category that were commanding a higher price premium that we were not taking advantage of. So net-net, put all of this together, 
We were able to then, as a result of that, set a full potential aspiration for, for our business in Japan right at the beginning. So we said, listen, we have a point of departure in 2012. The, there's going to be, we can't do anything about foreign exchange. That's going to continue to decline. So we are facing a headwind there. But if you then take the various building blocks that we can you know, do something about, like we can defend our margins by taking out costs, we can place more hot zones in the, in the convenience stores by, at the checkout counter, we can capture a greater share of diamond, we can drive our distribution, and we can capture new occasions if we did all of these, and we had specific initiatives behind these, that gets us to a full potential picture over a three-year horizon that we wanted to aim for. And this is what we sold up the line to our executive team and our, and our board. And we needed to do this because we needed to put a stake in the ground early in order for Japan to be given the license to actually do something about its business and drive, drive the turnaround. So then the second step, as soon as we created some air cover for ourselves, was to galvanize the team. And as I said to you, the morale was very, very low. Um, you know, when, when we, and this is probably for me personally the biggest learning from this whole experience, how important it is to set a single operating success measure for, for the business during a situation like this. The, the problem, even with market share, but particularly so with revenue and profit, is that it's like looking in the rearview mirror. I mean, most people in the organization can't directly influence that. Their activities in sales or in, on various functions around the business may or may not contribute directly to that measure. And it isn't, it isn't something that you can articulate very well to a, a factory in Nagoya, for example, on, on what, uh, what we're doing to drive up cost, uh, drive up revenue or, or, or take cost out. So what we did was we picked one single unifying measure, one operational lead indicator, which was the number of hot zones that we would place. So it was a very easy story to communicate. We said, it's very clear that a big part of our business is in gum. It's very clear that convenience store shoppers don't spend a lot of time in the aisle. We've got to place more hot zones. If we place more hot zones, we'll drive conversion. If we drive conversion, we'll drive revenue and share. So the more hot zones, the better our business will perform. That all of you guys can control. And let's set a hairy audacious goal for the first year. Let's go for 30,000 hot zones in the convenience store channel. We made a big deal of this. We announced it at our town halls. We had a kickoff meeting, sales kickoff meeting, where this was announced. There was reward systems were set up around this. And this became the single rallying catch cry for, for, for the business. And I think this worked really, really well. It lifted the, the, the spirits of the team. We backed this up with uh, you know, significant investment in training to make sure that our sales organization knew how to go about selling this uh, into, into our customer base and, and executing well in store. And we also created a sense of urgency by, and maybe War Room is not the best, um, and if I could go back in time, I'd probably change the, the, the wording of that. But it, it, it did work very well, because by creating a War Room, we were able to put very disciplined, very focused attention on, on the few performance measures that mattered the most. And it created a real sense of urgency and a real laser-like focus on those few things. So th these two things worked very, very well. The training, the capability investment, and the war room. The other thing we did uh, was communicate this extensively. Communicate the why. I mean, I, I don't know if you've seen, there's a Simon Sinek video on, on TED conferences that talk, he talks about how the why is more important than the what. And I, I think I would really agree with him there. And we spent a lot of time communicating. This is me standing in Nagoya at our gum plant with our management team there. And in fact, I'm presenting the same chart that I, that I put up earlier. Uh, and this, this was really, really proved to be really important. Uh, it wasn't easy in Japan, huh? You needed a translator and everything, and it's uh, not, a, not, not an easy thing. But nevertheless, we put a lot of attention on this. We did at least two of these a month in sales offices and plants around the region. Hot zones was critical, but we created four KPIs behind that. Hot zones, share of diamond, and gum and candy share. These were the four things that we measured quarter on quarter, and this was made visible in every plant, in every sales office around the region. And uh, it really created this focus on a few very important KPIs. So finally, the plan itself, and this is kind of the boring stuff. Uh, how did we actually set it up? Um, you know, we, we kept it really simple. We said there are three major work streams, consumer, customer, and cost. There would be one leadership team member that would own each major work stream. And the kind of 
activities we would carry out would be broken up into three things. Either it's an enabler that you really, really need in order to set you up for success in the following year. Or it's a no regret action that means that you, know, you don't need to prove anything. You know it's going to work and you know it's going to drive results this year, so just get on with it. Or it was a test and learn. That is, you know, it's a high risk activity that may or may not pay off that you needed to pilot and make some decisions on. Perhaps there was an investment associated with it. Right. So that was a test and learn activity. And that's how we set up the program plan on a page for, for, for full potential in Japan. We also had a specific set of activities around gross margin defense. Uh, our, our plants, just like yours, have always had a focus on cost reduction and efficiency. What we did, though, was we took the focus away from necessarily cost in itself and put the focus on on, on margin, which is actually what we were trying to solve for. And cost isn't the only way to solve for margin, right? Price, there's a number of levers for, for margin improvement. So by doing that, we were able to bring together disparate parts of the organization, including operations, around a single agenda to drive margin improvement. And we even set a goal, uh, you know, we want to drive 50 basis points, which was recover back. If you remember that bar chart I showed earlier where we'd lost 50 basis points, we wanted to recover it back to, to where, where we were before. So this is how we mobilized the plan. Uh, we set up a, a, a governance structure. It wasn't complicated. We had our board of management uh, reported into the global executive. Uh, we had our work streams where each board of management member owned each of those work streams. But we had a very, very disciplined drumbeat. You know, a few big initiatives. We said no to a lot of things. We made it highly visible, communicated the why, uh, put some lead indicators in place, rallied around 30,000 hot zones, weekly progress, monthly steer goes. So the kind of stuff you would normally expect. So what happened? The results. Um, the results were, were pretty good. First is the category. Because if you remember the hot zone that I talked about, where we were placing gum at the checkout counter, of course that was to drive share growth for our brands. But actually, if you think about it, because in the hot zone was also the competitor's product. What we were really doing was driving turnaround of the category, of the gum category. So the first point is, how did the category perform? If you remember, it was declining at 7% by the time we got to, uh, to uh, 2012. So we did, uh, and this is quarter on quarter performance, we did achieve a significant turnaround in, 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 in the performance of gum. So we lifted it from you know, quarter on quarter. At, at one stage, we were actually driving growth in the category by plus 1%. I mean, it's gone to slight decline again, but it's nowhere near 7%. So we had achieved a significant category turnaround. The other was our share. So in that category turnaround, we captured disproportionate share of that turnaround, which means our market share performance improved as a result. We lifted market share by 30 basis points. And a couple of specific customer success stories. Uh, if you take convenience stores, this is the Lawson chain. You know, uh, we implemented this. This is what a Lawson checkout used to look like. After we put our hot zones in, we achieved a 25% improvement in this particular convenience store chain. And uh, in a supermarket chain, we achieved over 100% lift at a particular store level. So actually, the success was, was pretty good. And, and the Japanese team had very much got its mojo back. Um, it is now, I mean, they are not out of the woods. Um, by, we, we are not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. However, I think that there is now a significant uh, momentum behind continuing this journey, despite the continuing devaluation of the Japanese yen, despite a number of setbacks we've had along the way. I think the team is very, very committed. And most importantly, I think by demonstrating some successes and showing that we had a clear full potential agenda, we also won back the trust of our US executive, which in a big multinational is, is, is in itself uh, you know, uh, an, an important thing to achieve. So those are the results we achieved. Um, key learnings for me personally, uh, which I'll share with you, and it'd be great to discuss in any, any questions you have. First is, you know, you've got to set an aspiration, but make sure it's anchored in insight. And this is not about analysis paralysis and months and months of, 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 of navel gazing. This is about very short, sharp, studies based around specific hypotheses you have to understand what is driving performance today, and then on the basis of that, setting an aspiration. This idea of you know, thinking big, starting small, scaling fast, 
is something I'm a big fan of, and this really did work well in the Japan case. That's exactly what we did. Uh, we set a big aspiration, a three-year aspiration, but we managed to quarter and yearly performance. Um, and then we scaled up quickly. Because while we implemented those various no regret actions that drove the performance this year, we also laid the foundation for those test and learn actions that were gonna give us the license to continue to scale up the following year. If, if, no matter where I do this now, I make a big deal of it, which is find that single non-financial KPI that you can galvanize the team behind. In our case, it was the 30,000 hot zones. In many other situations, even in our own business, it, it may be something else. And you know, um, the good thing about that KPI is, this, and, and when you're talking about a team that needs to have its morale lifted, there's nothing like an early taste of success. So an operational KPI that I can actually show runs on the board quickly really does lift the spirits. Invest in capability, but I don't, I don't think that's a, I'm telling you anything new there. I mean, obviously, it is important, right? But, be, but, but focused capability. And then finally, keep it simple. Uh, simple measures, light governance, but disciplined focus. Um, to me, these were the key learnings. We replicate these learnings in, uh, irrespective of whether it's a turnaround situation or whether it is a business that we're taking from good to great. We apply these same uh, very simple measures. Um, and, you know, uh, we've, had, we've had a number of successes since, since Japan using this kind of approach. So, that was what I had. Um, I thought I'd open it up for some questions and some discussion. Thank you so much. So due to timing, I will just get one question. Anyone? If not, you can always consolidate this before lunch. Any question? For Ganesh? There you go. The gentleman over there. Uh, so, in our case, we found that uh, the broader organization, uh, middle management and below, uh, it was easier to rally a team, a large team, around a non-financial KPI. That is something that was a lead indicator that ultimately could, people could make the connection to financials, uh, but it was, it was, it was, it was a more uh, optimistic and a more uh, you know, tangible measure. Because if you take something like a hot zone, you don't see the translation of the hot zone performance into your revenue in that same quarter in that same month. It follows the following quarter. So it becomes very much a lead indicator. And I think it was fundamentally for, for a business, particularly in this situation, and I'm not saying it necessarily needs to be non-financial in every situation. In this situation, you've got to remember where they were coming from. It was, the very, it was those financial measures that, themselves that had caused this kind of uh, negative cycle and, and, and negative morale. So we wanted to take the focus, we, we, we wanted to communicate, if you do the right things, the results will follow. And that's, that's, that was the spirit of, of the intent there. There's somebody here? Just one question. Yeah. Um, so in the, in the chart where you have shown that your market share dropped from one of the years, so how do you mobilize the whole organization when this is, because besides, uh, I mean, your factors which go on, Yep. Yeah, so the interesting thing was, even though the category had been in decline, uh, I would argue that in the preceding years, we did have those three drivers directionally right. I mean, we'd always been quite good at managing our costs. I mean, FX is something we can't control. But brand and in-store execution, uh, you know, I think by and large, we had in the past probably executed it with greater discipline without understanding necessarily that what we were doing was driving to a better share of diamond or, or, or better visibility in store. I'm not sure that that level of science was there. But I think that in the past, in an environment where the category was under less pressure, uh, the, the organization had executed in the past. What had happened by the time we got to 2012 was a series of execution missteps. And I think we needed to showcase what those missteps were by anchoring it in some fact. And that's, that's how we did it. We showed the fact, showed the clear connection to what, why it was driving our results, and that we could actually do something about it. And, and that's kind of how we mobilized the team. So. Thank you, guys.